for the state of the class. I have to hit, got it. I got it. Okay. Um, okay, so thanks for doing this, Michael. It's the first time I've done something like this for my blog. So- Well, it's so exciting and you've done such a great service to people who are trying to establish their careers. So if there's anything of value for my interview, I'm, I'm delighted to share it. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, okay, so the what my intent is, I wanted to record it just because I want to go back and listen and if, you know, if I can get sound bites or, or, you know, like, so I can, whatever, listen to it again, but I'll also send it to you. Um, okay, so can you summarize your long and eventful path? Yeah. Well, just like you, um, you know, I did my master's in international relations and, um, so I did that uh, at the London School of Economics. And it was interesting because I had a choice, like, do I study economics or do I study international relations? And uh, I was like, I was never that great at, at mathematics. So I was like, okay, well, this international relations thing seems like a better, a better path to go down. And then once you get into international relations, you can oftentimes pick a specialty. And the specialty that I picked, and the, it, it was kind of... Um, you know, that special moment in history that we all grew up in, uh, at least our generation, which was the Cold War. And so for me, being a child of the Cold War, the thing that really resonated with me was uh, nuclear weapons. So I wanted to be a nuclear arms controller. So it was kind of strange. It, you know, so I mean, when people hear about that, they think, oh, that's really unusual. And it was unusual, but I had some really uh, great professors who were really uh, you know, big, big thinkers on the subject. And I ended up uh, going down kind of a slightly different path um, in arms control. And at the time, the, uh, the really exciting thing was um, people were really obsessed with the, the numbers of weapons and the characteristics, uh, the characteristics of weapons. And a lot of times they were not that interested in the political aspect of, of people who had the weapons. So at the time, um, the United States was getting along very well with China, and that was not an area that we uh, that people worried about in the United States. They weren't worried about you know uh, any any wars with China. Uh, the French had nuclear weapons; we weren't worried about that. But the Soviets had nuclear weapons, and we were very worried about that. So that was the beginning of uh, of my career. And then um, after I did my master's degree, I went to the United Nations in Geneva, and I did a uh, an internship in Europe, they call it a stage. So, um, you know, it's always a great way for young people when they leave college to uh, to do an internship to try to figure out what you like and what you don't like. And, you know, I figured out, I figured out uh, several things I liked and several things I didn't like. But one of the things I didn't particularly like was just um, the ineffectiveness of a lot of these global uh, institutions like the UN. And uh, so that was that was really painful. And I think the other thing was that, and this is only part partly related to the Cold War, but um, you know it, it, there was so much effort that was put into um, you know hierarchy and how long people served in different offices, and it had nothing to do with trying to solve problems. It was just like, okay, did you work at this Ministry of Foreign Affairs for twenty years? Or had you only been working there for two years? If you only worked there for two years, you're an idiot. And if you worked there for 20 years, you might be an idiot, but we treat you well. You know, and, and so I didn't, I didn't like that. And so that was good to figure out what I didn't like. And, I, and so I highly recommend that for people when they're uh, thinking about their career paths is to, it's, I think, almost more important to figure out what you don't like and why you don't like it. <laughs> and, you know, um, and, you know, the other thing it's, um, it's uh, I often talk to young, young professionals about is just the importance of uh, studying aptitudes, because, you know, uh, you, you, uh, people's aptitudes stay the same their whole life, but their interests change. And so, you know, but, but, one, but one aptitude is problem solving and problem solving may not go along with all career choices you know just because you just because you like solving problems doesn't mean that all jobs offer that you know so and so people who really really are passionate about solving problems you know need need to think about uh, th carefully about how they you know how they choose their career path and then 
eventually after the sta after the stage at the United Nations, I went to uh, Washington DC and I ended up uh, uh, working at a foreign policy think tank. And um, at the time I wanted to do arms control, but it was very sexy and they didn't want, you know, it was very hard if you're going straight from graduate school. So they said, there's just, you know, this underfunded anemic program at the think tank. And it's all about uh, communications, international communications. And um, so reluctantly, I ended up uh, selecting that. But, but I think that the interesting thing is at that moment, in time, things were just about to change. So uh, for, for 50 years, it had been probably the most boring, you know, unexciting field. And then just right when I showed up, it turned out to be a really, really, it started to become a very dynamic field. And uh, working at a foreign policy think tank, it's the intersection of policy and it's the intersection of law and it's, uh, and also the intersection sometimes of industry and business. And so, you know, there was a paradigm shift that was starting to take place. And I think that uh, whenever there is a paradigm shift, and there's many, many, many paradigm shifts taking place right now in the world, but whenever there is a paradigm shift, uh, there's a lot of a lot of jobs and careers that get pressurized and sometimes get destroyed. But there's also a tremendous opportunity for people who want to get involved with things. So you know, for for people who are young and starting their career, uh, you know, there's uh, you know everything from social media to 3D printing all these exponential technology, genomics, and all these other things. Uh, so super, super exciting for people entering the workforce now or trying to reposition uh, in the early part of their, their career. I happened, I can't say I, I did it because I was smart, but it, it was just incredibly lucky that I showed up at this moment when everything was being disrupted, which was a great opportunity for me and maybe for people who were a few decades into it, maybe not as exciting as it was for me. That's great. But then you, um, so keep talking because um, you ended up, you know, starting a company and everything like when. Yeah. So, so the other part of the paradigm shift was that, you know, um, we, we knew these, this energy and momentum was changing. And in the U.S., uh, uh, competition in telecommunications was in the relatively early days. And so uh, for decades and decades and decades, AT&T had the ironclad monopoly, which was uh, imposed by the U.S. government. In fact, if somebody was a tourist and they flew to Hong Kong and they bought a Mickey Mouse telephone and they flew back and they plugged it into the wall, they'd be violating a federal law by doing that, which was silly and ridiculous. And 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 I think those are the things that also uh, help signal that a paradigm shift is about to take place. When things become so silly and so stupid, then people realize, okay, you know, something more intelligent has to happen. And so we, we came up with the conclusion that, um, that Western Europe, which, which really represented the values of the old AT&T and was still monopolistic and the government still controlled everything, that they would eventually have to, um, they'd have to introduce competition. They'd have to allow comp competition to, to take place. And it, one of the interesting things is that because Europe is more socialistic in the way that they do things, the way the, you know the way those governments and those countries are structured, um, the phone companies were the largest employers for the most part, the largest employers in many of these countries. And so, rather than trying to look at things from the citizens' point of view or the consumers' point of view, which is, like, hey, let's give the consumers as many choices as, the, as they want, let's give them a lot of different choices and pricing, let's let innovation take over. In Europe, it's like, no, we're just going to lock the door and we're going to just cling on to these jobs no matter how irrational it is. And so that's that's the climate that we had to go up against. And, it, you know, it was difficult. Uh, you know, it was uh, painful. But, but you know, the good news is that at least the logic was on our side, <laughs> even though the, you know, the governments and the policies. And, and the interesting thing is that under European law, each of the European countries was supposed to be open, but each of the European countries chose to violate European law and try to, you know, drag back progress. Uh, but eventually, the momentum became so powerful, it became it became very very difficult for them to do that. And then eventually, uh, these uh, countries and these phone companies went through a period of uh, privatization. So, oftentimes, the government sold. Uh, a great deal of the uh, ownership in those companies. Sometimes they held on to 
the ownership, but for the most part, they, they were put on the stock markets and they were privatized. And then they also, to be consistent with European law and to be consistent with competition law, then they had to allow others access to those networks. You know, so, you know, and when you run a project like that, I mean, it's part policy, it's part regulatory, it's part entrepreneurism, it's got all these different elements that are, are part of that. And, and, you know, and, and there's a lot of, for, you know, you're fighting a lot of forces that don't want to change. There's just a lot of resistance. And, you know, we sometimes talk about as antibodies and every big organization has antibodies. So if you have a great idea and you're in a big organization, all the antibodies come out and they try to kill it. And so, so, you know, that's what we had to fight uh, in Europe, but, but that's a, that's, but that's a consistent challenge in any big organization. And, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people who are trying to get things done in big organizations, they have to anticipate those challenges. Like, okay, I'm going to propose an idea that's that's really smart and practical, and uh, and but but then they have to, do, to have, they have to figure out a sneaky way to do the smart thing because if you do it uh, totally above board in a big organization, it'll get crushed. So everyone comes up with these very complicated <laughs> schemes to try to introduce ideas that are actually better for everybody, but you have to be mischievous in order to get the better result. And that's as, you know, and, and that was also what we were confronted with when we tr try to make change in Europe. Um, so that's when you went to, that was with the spree, right? Yeah, so that was with uh, a spree. And then, you know, I got involved with, um, uh, investing in some projects, and I was uh, one of the uh, kind of co-founders of a uh, internet infrastructure business in Europe. And it was interesting because back in the days in Washington when we first met each other, uh, you were one of the few people that was obsessed with infrastructure, and and infrastructure is like one of the hottest subjects right now. And so we started working on uh, internet infrastructure, and that was right at the time that. Uh, that companies like Facebook and Google and uh, other companies were trying to expand their European reach, so they needed access to uh, data centers. And in some cases, there was an interest in uh, trying to do green data centers, so trying to put them in locations where you could use ambient temperature, so in very, very cold climates, you could use the temperature to cool these data centers. Uh, so we were involved with uh, a number of those projects, but it was interesting because during that particular infrastructure project, one of the things I started to learn about uh, was that um, were innovative ways to uh, rapidly deploy fiber optic cables. We ended up deploying over 15,000 kilometers of fiber, mostly in, in, in Scandinavia and, and Northern Europe, and a lot of that was connecting these data centers that we either owned or that we worked with. And um, we and, and I got familiar with this concept called dig once, which was this idea that whenever you build a highway that uh, or expanded a highway, that you would allow um, uh, people to lay fiber at the same time. Because the thing you didn't want to do, uh, which happens all over the world all the time, and again it goes it goes back to this question about uh, you know how do you change uh, you know kind of essentially dysfunctional thinking, but um, so, so you don't want to be in a situation where you do a brand new road, and uh, oftentimes when you do a brand new road, and this happens all over Europe because you get all this European Union funding, but you build a brand new road, and then you say, hey, you know what, I really should do some fiber optics on the road. So then you have to cut into the road, then you have to put the fiber optics in, you have to stop a few lanes of traffic. It's very, very expensive, and it's very pollutive. And it's, it's just, and it's really just the creature of bad planning. But but when it works well, when everyone works together, uh, it's remarkable and it's incredibly efficient. So one of the things that 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 I started to think about was how could I take some of the lessons that I learned from uh, rolling out this these fiber networks in Europe, and how in a nonprofit context could I accelerate. Uh, you know, connecting people around the world by trying to be smart about how to do infrastructure so that, you know, and, and, the, and the challenge is that in any government, doesn't matter if it's a developing country or if it's a developed country, you oftentimes have, everything's very siloed. So the guys that deal with roads don't really talk to the energy guys and the like, and, and the people that deal with communications don't really like to talk to the road people. And oftentimes, you know, these guys, they're all monopolies. The road people in 
almost every state or in every country it's all run by the ministry of transport or you know the you know highway authority or whatever and so um so one of the things that we so one of the the transitions i guess i made in in my career was going from this kind of more you know business commercial entrepreneurialism to trying to apply some of the lessons that i learned uh to really focus on social innovation so how do you how do you look at things differently <laughs> and try to make a huge impact but to do it in more of a social entrepreneurial way than than kind of a commercial entrepreneurial way and also to essentially challenge the existing system which is a very siloed system which is a very inefficient system and um you know and and you know part of being a um you know social innovation is also trying to look at some of the the challenges that we face so it, so if you look at some of humanity's greatest challenges uh number one those are also some of humanity's greatest opportunities so it doesn't matter if it's hunger or it doesn't matter if it's energy or whatever though it's a great opportunity but i think that um the the other um aspect of that is trying to you know figure out how to move beyond silos because the world's largest problems are not siloed <laughs> you know so so and you know with the, with the pandemic you know the silo of the world health organization had no effect whatsoever on the pandemic and and it's just because it's so complicated it's it goes across so many functional areas and so even in the united states you know it's like you know you have people that deal with transportation or business or or you get into the fragmentation of the medical care system in the united states and you run into all these incredibly difficult problems they're not uh the, the problems are style well the the grand the grand problem is not siloed but the institutions are siloed and so and then people say well how come our siloed institutions can't deal with humanity's greatest problems it's because they're trying to look at it as a silo and those aren't that's not how the problems are organized yeah and actually what i found in government was the mission of each organization is very different and you have to stay within your like mission and even though it makes more sense to you know branch out and cooperate sometimes you know you know just the administrivia and bureaucracy makes it really hard even though it makes complete sense yeah so okay so i remember a spree and uh, you know you were in amsterdam and all that stuff and then you sold that and then did that and then that led to I mean, you. There was an interim step before Geeks, right? So yeah. So uh, for, uh, you know. So for you know, first I did the think tank, and then I did Esprit, and then after that, I got involved with um, this uh, internet infrastructure project oh, okay. in, uh, in Europe. And I, I served on the board. I wasn't really in an operational capacity, but I was on the board of that project. And then I went from that project to uh, to Geeks Without Frontiers. Okay. Got it. Okay. So do you think, did you just like fall into this path or do you think that you're intrinsically an, an entrepreneur? So, you know, it, it's interesting because I think that a lot of people who are entrepreneurs or, or people who are stuck living with entrepreneurs, you know, I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't really feel like they have a choice. I mean, it's just like kind of how they're wired. And so like if if someone's an artist or someone's a scientist, oftentimes they just don't feel like there's a lot of choice. It's like that's kind of who they are and that's what they want to do. Um, but I, I think that, you know, the other thing, the other way I look and, and I think so I, I feel like I resemble part of, you know, part of that thinking. Right. You know, that that, you know, we're just wired that way. But but I think for me, um, it's really uh, like in business. The, the, a lot of successful business people solve something that's painful for other people. So like, you know, if, it, if an organization is having pain, they're going to go reach out to somebody to solve that pain. Or if a company is having pain or if a customer is having pain, they're going to go, they want somebody to solve it. And, um, and so I think there are certain people that when they feel like they can solve a pain point, 
they can get very fanatical about it, <laughs> you know? So, so even though like, you know, going back to the at t example, like, you know, they, you know, there was this kind of artificial monopoly, which was totally irrational and it was unfair to consumers and it was ex incredibly expensive for no reason. Uh, it was a big jobs program, but, but the consumers had a pain, which is they wanted a lot of innovation, a lot of choices and lower prices. And so whoever steps in to solve that, um, you know, can hopefully the consumers like that and, they, and they're willing to pay for it. So I think, and this is both on the, on the social innovation side, but also the entrepreneurial side that s some people really want to solve problems. It's like a Rubik's cube. It's like, you know, people, people say, oh, it's impossible to fix the pandemic. And it's not impossible. I mean, it's just like a Rubik's cube. How do you solve, you know, how do you solve that problem or any other problem? It, it, it's, there's very few problems that, that, if you go back to first principles and you break up all the component parts of the problem, there are very few problems that can't be solved. It's usually the people or the institutions that are difficult, not the not the problems itself. It's not hunger itself. There's plenty of food. Uh, you know, maybe maybe for the next year with the Ukraine crisis, maybe that's an issue. But it's you know, there's plenty of water around the world and there's plenty of food. It's just about how do you get it to the people uh, to the people that need it. And um, so people who want to just, you know, fanatically want to solve a problem, just get s stuck on it. And, uh, and it's almost like a calling. Uh, and then there's some, you know, and it doesn't work out for everybody, you know, uh, but it, but there are people like Elon Musk or people like Steve Jobs, you know, the, the level, the level of fanaticism is so great. And these people, you know, for the most part, a lot of the people are super successful. They don't do it for the money. They do it because they're trying to solve something and it's almost more of a challenge. And so I think that's, that is often what um, motivates a lot of these uh, entrepreneurs and, and particularly the, the, I think the successful ones. But it's also, I think around risk, right? So um, you were young when you started, so there wasn't as much risk, but it's also being able to live with risk, you know, like risk bringing home money, you know, to keep your family going or whatever. I think you're more comfortable with risk than, than. Yeah. I, th I mean, I, th I think that entrepreneurs generally are willing to tolerate more risk and, and maybe that's because they are so passionate about the idea that they're pursuing, and it may not always be rational, <laughs> you know, because people could pursue it and it doesn't work. And, and then, you know, and, and, and then they, they feel like they've run out of options, but, but for the people, but, you know, for the ones that we all hear about, you know, cause it's like restaurants, you know, for every 10 restaurants, you know, you're lucky if one makes it, um, you know, and those people do it for the same reason. Like, you know, they, 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 they love food, they love community, they love this, but not only, only, you know, only a few of them are going to actually make it. So I think that, um, they do, uh, they do tolerate greater risk. And, and it's amazing when you read their personal stories, um, they, and you see that, you know, cause oftentimes these people make huge bets, you know, I mean, Elon's doing his, $40 billion bet on, uh, on Twitter, you know, and it's funny, right? Cause he was criticized, uh, by a lot of people. Cause they say, Hey, the smarter, uh, the, the richest person on the planet is going to own this important media outlet. And then when he said, Hey, I'm not really interested in doing the deal. People said, can you believe what a horrible person he doesn't even honor his deals. So now, but now it looks like he's going to honor his deal and, and he's going to end up owning this. Well, that's a huge risk. I mean, that's a $40 billion bet. And, um, and so I, a lot of these people, they, 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 they double down, they double down, they double down. And, uh, you know, at one point Elon was basically next to bankruptcy, you know, was going through a divorce. Tesla as a, as a car manufacturer, wasn't making it, uh, the, um, Falcon rockets were not yet successful. So tremendous. So he went from being wealthy to almost being bankrupt. And, uh, and these, the, and so it takes, a tremendous amount of determination and, uh, you know, and also a lot of self-confidence to, for these people to, to, to struggle through this. And then to, for a relatively young person to become the richest person on the planet is, is extraordinary. But the more important thing is the areas of innovation that he continues to innovate and in, just like Steve Jobs, but, you know, basically the war in the Ukraine is successful for the Ukrainians because of Starlink, which is dreamed up by Elon Musk. 
he now has more satellites in space than any country on the planet, <laughs> you know, I mean, which is amazing. Who can imagine that? And also, you know, of course, Tesla, you know, revolutionizing cars. I mean, everyone, if, if anyone were to bet on it, they'd say that should have come out of Detroit. Detroit is the, uh, the, the capital of car manufacturing on the planet. Well, it used to be. I mean, it's probably someplace in China, but um, but no, it was. It turned out it's Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley was going to change uh, change electric cars, and so and and even with the boring company, the tunneling company. I mean, just amazing innovation and possibility of uh, further innovation. So, I think that's. It, it, there's a lot of risk, but I think that these people are. Um, you know, are willing to do it because they believe so much in the ideas that they're trying to uh, that, that they're 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 trying to bring to the world. And that would be you, also. <laughs> it's it's like it the chase, and I can see that that. Yeah, I mean, and that part of it is addictive. I mean, and and um, yeah, I mean, and it's interesting, right? Because oftentimes. And people go look for jobs. It's you know it's it's very frustrating because you do everything by the book. You you know you apply to the the human resource office, and these human resource offices historically have been disastrous, right? They 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 oftentimes don't bother to respond to people, and they oftentimes don't know what's going on in their organizations and stuff. And so a lot of people when they apply for jobs, they get very discouraged. They're like you know and. and so entrepreneurs, their whole life, everything they're told, no, it's impossible. And then they're told all the thousands of reasons by people who know nothing about why what they're doing is impossible. And they're so used to it that by the time they they get their first big win, you know, first of all, you know, you, it just makes people incredibly stubborn, right? Because this is like, really, you know, it's like, really this person who shouldn't be telling me that that I'm an idiot is telling me I'm an idiot, an idiot. So it just makes people more stubborn, more determined. And then when they do get a success, like when they get a big order for the, you know, the first big order, then yeah, they, they, they celebrate that, but then they just get more determined to get onto the next level, you know, <laughs> to, to further, you know, kind of confirm that their idea was the right idea <laughs> and, and that these other people were wrong. And that's what, that's what drives these people, you know, and, you know, some of these people, they, you know, they, they don't sleep at all. They, you know, they, you know, Elon has these, you know, these famous things where he only needs three or four hours of sleep or whatever, you know, these people are, are you know, fanatical, but they, but it's, it's, it's almost like a dynamic that gets created that even makes them more fanatical. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I forgot what I was, uh, it'll come back to it, but um, so what have you learned from the various enterprises you've been involved in? in starting or expanding um so um you know i think that um you know you know when when things go well i think people you know ho hopefully people have either humility or gratitude or both and like you know if it, if the project goes well hopefully people you know f uh, have those those sentiments but i also think you know um going back to the, you know the frustration that these uh, entrepreneurs often feel um, it's it, the one thing is amazing is how resistant these these systems and institutions can be and how, you know and how frustrating that can be um, and then and then the 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 flip side of it is that it is also amazing that once there is traction and once there's momentum oftentimes how fast things can move so I mean so literally things could be resistant for 10 years or 15 years but then in 15 months everything can change and I think that, uh, you know, in I think in life, but also in entrepreneurism, I think that's one of the hard things to wrap your brain about. You know, it's like, you know, I could really like, you know, this rock, I have to push it all the way up this hill. And, and but but then if you like, if, if you pull off the miracle and you get it to the top of the hill uh, and then it's like, wow, and the, you know, it, it is possible. And now we can get it to the other side. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know what I want to ask you. Um, like, do you get nervous or anxious about, you, you don't, you don't, you don't transmit like that you get nervous or, you know, like you always seem very calm, cool, mm -hmm. and collected. but what's Mar really going on? Like, do you get nervous or are you able to turn off the. Yeah. yeah Margaret, Margaret will disagree. You know, I think that, um, 
whenever you push things to the edge, you know, there's always those uncomfortable moments, you know, and it's, uh, you know, and it's a, it's the same with a lot of endeavors, you know, like people in automobile racing, it's like they're on the, on a corner, you know, and if you do, if you want to win the race, you have to be at the edge of being out of control <laughs> or surfing, you know, it's, I mean, it's all, it, it surfing would be a good metaphor also. Um, but yeah, cause you're trying to do these big ideas and, um, and I think the other thing about uh, entrepreneurism as as an activity, but also as a career, is it's so much like a roller coaster. I mean, like you know, uh, you could you know, and and uh, what you know, one of the obvious ones to to point out. There's been a lot of um, a lot of value that's disappeared over the last six months. You know, trillions and trillions. I think seventy two trillion dollars globally has disappeared. You know. Um, with the financial markets and stuff. But I, I was just meeting with somebody recently and um, the person is a founder of one of the cryptocurrencies. And a year ago, the guy was worth a billion dollars. And um, I met with him a few weeks ago and he's now worth $50 million. <laughs> so, you know, and so, you know, and maybe in two years he'll be worth a billion or a billion and a half, you just don't know. And I think that is really hard for a lot of people like, um, but again, it's like, you know, th this person, the way they run their life, nobody would know the difference. I mean, he's just, this person's just staying, you know, just staying on course. He's not changing anything and, um, and, and just really, really focused on transforming a whole bunch of industries. And, uh, and so I think that's hard for a lot of people to get their head around. Are you um, into crypto? I have some exposure to crypto. <laughs> so uh, I'm thinking and, about buying some Ethereum. Should I? Um, I think, you know, um, I, I generally never make, uh, you know, um, recommendations, but I will say that people who are interested in uh, crypto, uh, well, first of all, there's an argument that uh, no matter what your um, portfolio is, and, there's, and this includes publicly traded uh, companies, some people argue that some percentage, and it could be as little as one percent, should have exposure to cryptocurrencies. What they're arguing, and this this was the argument that was six months ago, where they're saying, "Hey, if you kept your money in the bank, it was you got zero percent interest, and at the time you had five percent inflation. So now you have nine percent inflation. So uh, so basically, if you're a publicly traded company and you have your money in the bank." you're losing 8% every day, you know, uh, or on an annual basis or whatever, by just keeping it there. So, um, so that's one argument. And, and you could probably make the same for, pe for people who, you know, that some percentage should have some exposure. But I think it also goes down to the back to the philosophy of programmable money, which is that if people believe in this concept that there should be programmable digital currency, and that those could be connected with like smart contracts and transactions and so on and so forth, I think that it seems like it would make sense for people to have some exposure to that. But if they're not interested in that stuff and they don't believe in it, then they should definitely not do it. <laughs> and, and there's also, you know, the other part of it is uh, also that, uh, you know, all these things are, you know, by definition, they're high risk. And, um, and it's interesting, right? Because the stock market, which everyone generally tries to say is, you know, very, very predictable and, blah, 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 you know, um, it's also defying all the rules right now. <laughs> so, uh, so it's it's just really hard to make to you know to make these predictions. Yeah. Okay. So, what advice do you have for those um, that are interested in going down the entrepreneurial route? So you know it's interesting because um, I think uh, I think a, <laughs> I think a lot uh, a lot of young people um, might think it's really sexy and exciting and fun, and I think that. Um, and I think they really should think about, you know, things like, like, like you mentioned, like, you know, what is their aptitude for risk and, you know, and do, you know, do they feel like they have some of the characteristics and aptitudes that they think might be necessary to uh, see a project through or to see a company through. Um, but it's definitely not a shortcut to, um, to creating value. I mean, if people look at it as a short term, uh, as a shortcut, but it's not. And then I think the other thing is that a lot of people point to Zuckerberg and they point to Jobs and they point to um, Elon and they say, hey, these guys are college dropouts. So a lot of them say like, 
hey, I'm going to be a college dropout. And it's like, you know, of course, the answer is like, you know, uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't think you, you're you like that. I mean, there's very few people on the planet that are, are like these guys. And you and, don't hear about all the people who failed. Yeah. And so, so, I mean, so for some young, inexperienced person that, you know, who, who may not be accurate about their own self, their honest own self-assessment about their strengths and weaknesses, like, you know, you know, it's it's amazing that those guys were able to do what they've done. And St and Bill Gates also was a dropout. Um, but but the but the reality is that, you know, they're one in a million, you know, and so so, and, you know, and, you know, so 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 someone believes if they can say, like, I'm a one in a million person and I've got all these amazing superpowers, blah, blah, then, you know, then maybe that's the right thing for them. But there are a lot of people who I've heard say that, like, oh, I can drop out of college and I'll be just like these guys. But for literally for every million people that would say that, there's one that would be the real deal. You know, and, and there is, I mean, the, the one good thing, though, um, in Silicon Valley and elsewhere is that there is so much technology change and also opportunity for people in coding and other things that um, that it is possible to be successful and not have a degree and, and to be successful in Silicon Valley, but not everyone's a founder. So people could be like, you know, they could be someone who decided, hey, college is just not my cup of tea and I really like programming. And they could be very successful in the context from a career point of view in the context of a Facebook or a Google or whatever. But um, but that doesn't mean they'd be a, a, a great CEO. They could just be a great programmer, a great developer, which is fine. I mean, that's not a bad thing, but, but, but if, if, that is, if that's the their best superpower, they should be honest with themselves and 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 maybe not promote themselves as a CEO <laughs> if if in fact they're just a great developer or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I see that. Um, okay. So just general, either specific or general advice for early to mid career folks. Yeah. Well. Um, I mean, so I'm probably not the right person to give advice for, you know, for people that want to do traditional careers. So I, I mean, you know, because I, I, I didn't, I, I apparently I failed, <laughs> I failed in that, in that area. But, but I would say that, um, well, you know, so one of the things I think, well, so one of the things if, and, and this is, you know, this is, I think, an interesting uh, decision point for people, which is that if, so if people say like, look, I want to be a fanatical problem solver. And I, and I really I, like, I, I don't think the current system, whether it's a commercial system or a governmental system or whatever the institution, academic institution, I don't think that these systems are, is delivering things the best way they can. And so I want to solve that problem. And if they're fanatical about it, they may want, they may not want to do a traditional career, but if they if they do go down that route, I mean, I would say for those people that um, you know um, problem solving is super super important, and also I think you know for me I think kind of core values are important, and but but and one of those core values I think is trying <laughs> trying to be honest with yourself and hopefully honest with others. But really being honest with with oneself, and I think and and part of but part of being a and part of being a problem solver is you have to understand the limitations of your strengths and weaknesses. And everybody's got them. I mean, even the you know the smartest people on the planet have their strengths, their strength, you know, their strengths and weaknesses. And the other thing is, you know, uh, and I would say, you know, people should uh, no matter what they do, even if they do something innovative, they should really have mentors. I think mentoring is super super important. And I also think this for people who want to be relentless problem solvers, I think also this process that Elon does, which is breaking things into first principles, trying to get to the the very essence of the problems and the you know the most basic part of the problems, understanding those and then building solutions on top of that. But if someone says, hey, look, I'm not really interested in that. I'm really more into the quality of life. I'd like to have, you know, it's like, you know, I'd like to have, you know, a great family. I'd like to have a stable uh, life. I'd like to have a great retirement. And I'm not, inter I'm not interested in changing the world. It's just like, it, it seems like a lot of hard work, really painful. And, and what if it doesn't go right? <laughs> you know, it's like, and what if people don't listen, you know? And so, so, and if people say, hey, I want a more traditional, more conventional job. I mean, the thing that I would say other than mentors, 
I would say that nowadays, and, and this is also different from, and I know you've written about this in, in, in your blogs, but I would say that, you know, the old system of loyalty, even two-way loyalty or even one-way loyalty is gone. And, and so I think people have to become their own platforms. And I think part of becoming your own platform is also um, having your own social media platform. Mm -hmm. Super, super important. And, you know, and it, uh, it doesn't matter what people think of these individuals, but if you look at people like uh, Trump or you look at people like um, Elon Musk or you look at the Kardashians or any of these people, uh, they have, um, they have uh, basically leveraged social media and they and and oftentimes created billions of dollars. I mean, it's interesting. You almost see there almost are no Tesla commercials. There's almost no commercial because Elon doesn't need it. He's got Twitter. He's basically got his own television channel called Twitter. <laughs> he, he, before he bought it, you know, he had his own television and you know, and the same for Trump, you know. And not to say that these things can't be manipulated for bad, but they can be manipulated. You know, it's it's a it's a platform could be manipulated for for good or for for bad. So I think platform, uh, you know, people becoming their own platform, establishing in their networks. And I think and I think it's it may, I mean, I think it's important for everybody. I think probably more so for entrepreneurs, but I, but hopefully for everyone, because I just think it's really, really important for people to keep on learning. And, um, you know, and I think we're going through this period, you know, we were just talking about um cryptocurrency and programmable money and this and that there you know if if the vision of those play out it's going to create trillions and trillions of dollars of opportunity and if you know and there's a lot of people that just say hey i'm not interested it sounds complicated it's out of my comfort zone which is all fine i mean people don't you know they don't have to be excited about that stuff um then uh and and then is but it's hard to be an innovator uh, or um you know it's hard to drive important organizations if you if people are unwilling to learn and so and people could say like i don't like computers like i i don't people you know i don't like email i don't like social media i don't like uh you know web 3.0 i don't <laughs> i don't like cryptocurrency well, I mean, people can say whatever they want to say. It's just, but it's also, but people also are making decisions about, you know, how relevant do they want to be? And that's, that's an important question, you know, because, you know, and, and, it, and it may be possible that people say, hey, you know, being relevant is not that important, you know, because lifestyle is important. Spending time with my family is important. Enjoying music is important. Those things are important to me. And that's totally legit. But, but, but they should just know they should make a conscious decision about that. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's my, that's my only, uh, you know, my only comment. And, you know, I, I know, um, I have a friend who recently retired and she said, look, I hate, I hate technology. I hate spreadsheets. I hate emails. I hate this. I hate that. So she's like, I, I retired early. I solved the problem. And then that's fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. But there's also a lot of people that, uh, who are older, who, realize like I, I know people in the art business and they and they like do you know how hard it is to do an art show to physically bring all the art pieces to an art gallery it costs you know over ten thousand dollars and all the insurance and all, and all that stuff and um so when they think about nfts and uh, uh you know and digital art it's like you know there is another way to do it not to say they should do it but it's like you know, people have a choice. They can do one or the other. And, um, and it's, and at the end of the day, it's not for me to judge. It's up to, for the people who are interested in that stuff to figure it out. So um, I think the social media presence thing is interesting. So, you know, I think it's, I, I get from what you're saying that if you're in a more traditional job, like not entrepreneurial, um, it's good to still use it social media, you know, LinkedIn or whatever to build your network. I think, I think for people, even with conventional careers, you know, people, yeah. it's, I think it's a number, I think, you know, so it doesn't matter if people are entrepreneurial or traditional career, I think mentors are super important. And I think if people are traditional careers or entrepreneurial careers, I do think building their personal platforms are important because, you know, you could have a traditional career and one day something can change, you know, and they, and, and all of a sudden 
you're like, uh, you know, like, like, and uh, a company can go bankrupt or an agency could be shut down or an agency could be merged or whatever. And uh, I mean, a lot of things can happen. People get, get relocated against their will. I mean, there's so many things that can happen. And, um, and I think that uh, there's a network, there's a mathematical network effect that like, you know, so, you know, uh, that for every additional person you add onto the network, you're mathematically creating this network effect. And so if somebody, even in a, you know, very, you know, they say, hey, I'm an accountant and I, I've been forced to move to a new city and now I have to start my career. Uh, it makes a difference whether they have 10 LinkedIn connections or they have a hundred LinkedIn connections. It just does. And it's a mathematical thing. It's not a, it's not a value statement. And so, so I would say, and so, so with a conventional career, I think it's important. And, and, and I think it's part of the platform. I mean, it's expanding your network, but it's also part of the platform. And I just, um, I just, I have a call tomorrow morning with uh, a friend of mine from 30 years ago and, you know, came through LinkedIn and we're, we have similar uh, current interests and stuff like that. And, you know, when you least expect it, something, you know, something interesting, exciting, you know, even if it's, if you just catch up and, uh, you know, you spend a few minutes just, you know, saying, hey, what happened over the last few decades? Uh, but also it just, what a, what a great thing that we're doing the same sorts of projects. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I have to tell you that with my blog, it didn't go the way, it didn't go exactly the way I wanted, but the best part about it is that I'm hearing from people from like my whole life at uh -huh. different times who, for whatever reason, like one blog resonates or whatever. It's just been so interesting how I hear from people. Right, and, and, and I imagine whatever recollection you have, they might have a different recollection or they have selected to pick a recollection that could be parallel, but still interesting, which you might not have remembered. <laughs> right, right. Or, you know, it's just nice to connect, you know, with, with people that you haven't either been in touch with or haven't thought about you know it's kind of cool um anything you regret or celebrate from your past well you know i i i try not to have regrets because i just think that that's not a ticket to success like if you if you have a whole drawer filled with regrets that just is not a healthy thing but but i think everybody naturally has regrets like you know it's like People always say like, hey, should I have bought this house or, or did I really do the right thing by selling this house or this or that? And, you know, I think that that's normal, but you just can't let it, you can't let it hurt your life. I mean, and I, I think, I think for me, when I think about regrets, I think about education. I mean, like for me, if I do something wrong, the most important thing is to learn from it, not to regret it. <laughs> you know, so, and 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 I think we have, but 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 you know, even if it's uncomfortable, I think we have to be honest with that. And 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 part of being honest might be that hey, that was a bad, that was a stupid decision. But but if we reflect on it, then hopefully we don't, uh, you know, do the same mistake two years later. I mean, hopefully we we reflect on it and we try to grow as humans. It's hard to do, right? Because people, you know, it's not, the human condition doesn't really encourage us to do that. But I think that's really like, in my view, particularly for entrepreneurs and innovators, I think people have to listen, but I think they have to try to be as honest as they can about their shortcomings. And, you know, it's interesting. There's been a study where they, uh, they looked at people um, with dysgraphia, people who've been successful. And there's a number of, of um, you know, uh, obvious people who, who people hear about a lot, but Charles Schwab has uh, dysgraphia, uh, he, excuse me, has dyslexia and Richard Branson has dyslexia. And so one, one of the things that uh, social scientists were trying to figure out was like, why do people with these, um, these challenges, why are they successful? And one of the, one of the theories is that because they realize they have these shortcomings, they're actually more willing to delegate than people who actually have better, who, who are stronger and more capable in those areas, but it's harder for them to delegate. So it's kind of interesting. So I, but, I, but I think being honest, so someone could say like, you know, and I mean, it, you know, one that you hear a lot about people say, oh, I, I hate, I hate personal finances. I hate money. I hate this, or I, you know, whatever. You, I hate paperwork. You know, people. I hate paperwork. 
But then the thing is like, either you got to learn to do it or you got to find somebody that can do it. But if you're, if you, but if you can't do either, then you're doomed. <laughs> you know? So, so and I think that's one of the reasons why it's important for people to try to, you know, dive into their strengths and weaknesses. But um, no, I, I think that in terms of like celebrating things, you know, I mean, I was just lucky because I, like you said, I, I got started at an early time. And I think you're, you're right about um, people. Can, it's when you have less to lose. So when you start younger and you do something entrepreneurial, you know, it is much, much easier to catch up, you know, and, and also like when people do something like um, the entrepreneur or they're a young person, they get appointed to an important project, or maybe it's a startup company, they end up learning a lot more than they would had they gone to a big traditional company. And then if they get the big company and they like, yeah, you just do this tiny little piece, but you, they go to a company in Silicon Valley, it's like, it's brand new. And they're like, okay, you're in charge of marketing and sales and you're in charge of this and you're in charge of that. So, the, you know, they're like 26 years old and they've already done tons of stuff. Right. So that even if it fails, like they've already learned tons of stuff and it failed. So it's easy to recover, but you're right. I mean, later in life, it's, it's harder to recover, but I think that, you know, so by starting off early, I was able to take higher risk, but also I was able to, um, spend more time with my family. So that's one of the things I celebrate. I mean, for me was that uh, the way that my career worked out was like, like I could do both. I could do something I thought was important, but also I could, uh, I was able to have more time to do other things, you know, and, and, you know, and it's funny, right? Because when we look back, I mean, part of that also was that you had the 2000 meltdown of the stock market and a lot of people, you know, chose to do other things just like in 2008, when everything melted down, people people changed jobs. And even with um, pandemic, right? People, all of a sudden people could do things remotely and then people uh, either stuck with their same jobs but did it remotely or a lot of things were changed. And I think that, um, you know, trying to celebrate the people who go on the journey with you, <laughs> you know, hopefully, you know, hopefully you have gratitude for those. And, um, you know, and, and hopefully just have a, just celebrating the the idea that hopefully you leave the world a slightly better place than you found it if you know if you pick the right project the right initiative the right enterprise that you know that you know you work hard you've you've innovated things you know maybe internally and maybe externally but hopefully hope and, and maybe leaving the tools behind that make it easier for the next generation to hopefully solve the problems that the earlier generations have struggled with yeah. Well, you definitely are committed to that. I mean, I so admire you, really. I just, every time I talk to you, you're involved in even more things. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and I mean, and, and that, and some, it's interesting, right? Because sometimes it is that sometimes it's a superpower because sometimes a lot of these things connect. And, um, you know, so like, so, you know, it's like, People might say, hey, what's the connection with outer space? What's the connection with art? What's the connection with crypto or whatever? And, and you know, there there is a connection, right? But it's, um, you know, but there's a certain amount of serendipity with all that stuff. But I think that, um, yeah, is that you, you're able to make more, like more connections and kind of uh, in leaps of faith to get certain things done. But, you know, the downside is that, if people get too spread too thin, sometimes it's difficult to really um, to really have the impact that you want. So I think it's really you know that that becomes uh, a huge problem, and I think that's a, a human problem, right? Like if you know you don't want to be so narrow that you know you you wake up, you have food, you go to bed. I mean that's like that's too small of a footprint. But also, you know, if you do too many things, then at some point you feel like you're not being as effective. So I think it's trying to find that balance for sure. Yeah. Well, I can imagine for you, you know, you're open-minded and that's what allows you to go in these different directions. And I think you're able to handle a lot of stuff. Like you can handle a lot of things getting thrown at you. Um, there is a lot of multitasking, which sometimes can be okay. And, and then, <laughs> you know, they say, I mean, there's studies that show that multitasking is, you know, it degrades performance. But uh, but sometimes I think it is efficient, <laughs> you know, to to multitask. <laughs> so I, again, that's also I think a balancing issue. Yeah, well, that's definitely part of your superpower. All right, I'm gonna just 
stop recording. Okay.